This is what we do every Wednesday. Okay, uh, uh, you know, Father covers uh, one area of, uh, that involves a little more thinking on your part type of a presentation. I do a lot of these type of presentations, historical and so forth. And uh, uh, we'd love to see a crowd like this every Wednesday. I mean, uh, the guys back there are, are cooking this marvelous food. By the way, we really need to thank Pete. Stick your head out. This is the last one. Enjoy the Shroud of Turin, and just keep in mind, this is basically the type of thing we do every week, okay? So let us know what would interest you. Now, what we're going to talk about tonight is something uh, really, really unusual and different, and I, I don't even know how to go about starting on this one. Uh, usually, like the Shroud of Turin, it was such an easy thing to talk about the last days of Christ, uh, just jump right into it and go with it. But this, this is so different. This is a different world we're going to now. It's like we're on a spaceship and we're going to a different planet. It is different. Is there anyone else besides Father and I that have been to Mount Athos? Okay, so, uh, so there's five of us here. Father will be uh, interjecting in his commentary as we go along, as we see, as he, uh, you know, we progress on the program. And the way I'd like to take this, is I like to take it with how it impressed me, what, what excited me about what I saw and what we did there, okay? Um, I've got a lot of pictures to show you and so forth, but I'm going to show you other things that, that to me made it uh, Mount Athos. And I'd like to keep in mind that this, what you're seeing was a trip that's organized by this church in a way. I mean, we're the ones that organize this trip every year. It's in your heart. If this is something you really want to go see, then go. Make it work for yourself. That's all it is. You're in control of your lives. I know you've got this, we got this, we got that. You'll, you'll be, get the 60s like I did before you'll get over there, right? It's, it's there for you now. If you're so inclined to talk to me, I'll give you the details for the Jerusalem trip. Um, the prices are really, good. Uh, the bishop insists that these prices be so that everybody can go. Um, you know, the, the, the ballpark price is always somewhere in the low $3,000 area. That includes your flight over there, that includes your meals, that includes your hotels, that includes the tips, that includes all the entry, you know, it's everything. So um, I hope, I hope uh, you're moved to the point that uh, you go on these trips and, and join us next time. Uh, Mount Athos is uh, an incredible place. I mean, what, what can we tell you? It's just magnificent. And you should have all have seen this icon already when you walked in, because I have it over here. This was a purchase. I bought this one. I'm going to discuss about it a little bit later, because it's very, very special to me. And it's one of the things that made my trip uh, very special. But Mount Athos, the word itself, Mount, uh, the, the Greek word is uh, Io Oiron, which means holy mountain. Um, originally, it was called Mount Athos. And uh, the, this, what you're seeing here, is the icon of Mount Athos. And you've got a picture of it on your little handout that I gave you. Uh, there's more handouts in the back there. If anybody uh, wants a copy, feel free to take it. It's a little historical background on the trip, or on Mount Athos, and I'm going to give you some of that now, anyhow. But uh, Mount Athos, the name, uh, really is not anything spiritual, it's anything but spiritual. It uh, more, uh, has more to do with mythology. The word Athos uh, actually was a, myth a mythological god uh, uh, who did battle with uh, Poseidon. And I'm sure you all know the name of Poseidon, the, uh, the Greek god of the sea. And he did a battle with Poseidon over this area of land that will become known as Mount Athos. Uh, and what he did was he took a, a, a mountain, boulder like a huge mountain, and tossed it at Poseidon in his rage. And that became Mount Athos. That's how Mount Athos was 
point, and that's why it's the name Mount Athos. Uh, but uh, eventually, it would evolve into the holy mountain, Hagia Oros. So when you go to Greece, and you go to the area that's Hagia Oros, I mean, they, they refer to themselves as the Athenites, but it's Hagia Oros, the holy mountain. Um, and it's the holy mountain because of the icon that you see, the person on that icon. Um, she's the one that, that really uh, historically made it holy. And it's known as the Garden of the Virgin Mary, the Garden of the Theotokos. Uh, she resided there for, for a while. And she ended up there by chance. It wasn't something she intended to go and see. She happened to be um, going. Uh, she was going to go with John, uh, who was her caretaker at the time. And they were going to go from Constantinople, and that, that, that I'm sorry, yeah, that Ephesus, it was that area, that right outside of, uh, yeah, right outside of Ephesus where she stayed for a little bit. She was going to travel from Turkey and go to uh, Constantinople, I believe, but she got into a storm. There was a, a storm in the sea, and she ended up on Mount Athos, uh, actually at the spot of the Vero, where, where you went, is, uh, where they dedicated the spot that she went there. And she fell in love with the place. And she asked her son that uh, she said that you know would you give this island to me? I, I want this place as my home. And being the obedient son, as Christ always did what his mother asked, and uh, it became the Garden of the Theotokos. In early history, we know Constantine the Great actually went there. Uh, Constantine the Great, you know, I'm not going to show you that yet. Constantine the Great went there. Uh, and uh, this is back around 324 AD. This is right before he had the uh, First Council of Nicaea, right before he moved uh, Constantin or Rome to Constantinople. Constantinople wasn't in the picture at this time, and he was looking for a place to move uh, the Roman Empire, and this is one of the areas he looked at. And he actually built, they say, historically, three parishes there, three churches. Uh, Eviron uh, and Batopedi, which you're going to hear an awful lot. We spent our time at Batopedi, and I'll explain uh, that name and more about that one. That is the home parish, the home uh, monastery of our bishop. When he was 16 years old, he went there, resided there for many years, and uh, every time we go back, they all come out from the, the, whatever they're doing and they greet him at the dock. I mean, he's like the, the, the little boy who left and came back, you know, did really good in life because he you know, acceded to the throne of the metropolis, metropolitan. So uh, we, we were so well taken care of on this trip, so well because of, of his presence. But Constantine the Great uh, did some, uh, built these three par uh, areas that were burnt down eventually, or very shortly afterwards, around the 6th century, by uh, Julian the Apostate. Uh, and uh, I think you've heard that, uh, anybody who's done any study in the history, this Julian um, caused an awful lot of trouble in the church and tried to eradicate almost just everything that, uh, that was Christian, and he had these uh, monasteries burnt down. And then they were rebuilt again by uh, several monks, um, very famous monks were uh, Athanasius was one of the three, there were three in a, in a, in a certain area, Athanasius was one of them, but uh, they, they rebuilt these areas. So we know that uh, established monasteries started as early as the um, uh, 10th century, the early part of the 10th century, 950, 924, and, and actually some of them that were rebuilt, like Papa Pedi, they claim was even older than that, going back to uh, maybe the the 7th century and the 6th century. But there's no documentation of a lot of these things. Right? They didn't have any recorded history there because the reason they were there is to get away from everything else. Right? They were there to, to solely pray for us, solely pray for the world, uh, a place of solace. It became, because of that, uh, it became a great place for relics. When uh, the, the iconoclastic period in the 8th century, when that hit, uh, a lot of the icons went in hiding to Mount Athos. They would hide them. They threw, uh, and we're going to talk about a couple stories that, that happened with those. Uh, so they established and developed many, many relics. And it is these relics um, that adds some of the, the special nature of the place. Um, that's not the only thing, but, but certainly the, the, the emotional experiences that we had, uh, many of them, 
came around uh, the relics. Uh, they honored uh, Father Steve and Father Betty by giving him the most sacred relic on the island. Okay, that uh, I keep calling it an island. It's not an island. It's a peninsula. Okay, just to make that clear. Uh, we'll show you a picture of it. But um, they they had Father Steve with all with the, the uh, Bishop Alexios there, and, uh, all the other uh, uh, priests and monks that were in his uh, service. It was Father Steve that got the honor of carrying the belt of the Virgin Mary. They actually had the belt of the Virgin Mary there. So we're going to talk about that later. Okay. So now. But, to begin with, this trip was not only Mount Athos. Huh? We're going to focus on Mount Athos. We're going to you know, give you as much as we can in, a, in an hour and 15 minutes. But um, there were some other things that happened along this trip. This trip started in Greece, in Athens. Uh, you've all been to Athens, most of you have, so I don't have any pictures here of Athens. Um, but we were following like the footsteps of St. Paul. So we went through areas that he went, uh, and uh, one of the areas that he went was um, Thessalonica, okay, and that is on the way to uh, Mount Athos. And right before Thessalonica, uh, on the way, a little bit detoured, but close enough, was this magnificent, magnificent place called Medera. And so I've got to just show you some things on Medera because this was equally as. Um, when I say impressive, again, I'm talking strictly of a spiritual sense. Uh, I have never felt more love than any place I've been to, including, including uh, Mount Athens. I felt a stronger feeling from the nuns, uh, and, uh, the, and the Geronisa, the, uh, the elder nun, the leader who, who looked like she was in her 30s, I mean, uh, she was very young, but just magnificent people, beautiful smiles, and so willing to, to cater to us and take care of us, to our comfort and everything. We went to the uh, monastery of St. Stephen's, and that is a, a female monastery, or in other words, it's all operated by nuns, but a priest does go so that he can uh, conduct the services. We went to a very early morning, how early, what time was it? It, was four, it wasn't 4 o'clock, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't 5 o'clock, it wasn't yet. Yeah. I mean, it was dark when we got there. Um, that is the chapel, and that chapel or the church that they had the uh, morning service is about the size maybe of this area right here. All these places are, are small, uh, especially when we get to Mount Athos. The chapels and so forth are not big churches like we have here that you see, but there's big property. All right? So there's many little different vignettes that they have there. They have many chapels in these places. I'm going to show you one church there that actually has three chapels in the altar. Three self-serving type, uh, large enough to be a, their own service uh, in the altar. Uh, but this place is just just breathtaking. It's heaven. When we got there, it was dark. It was starting to light up. I think it started to get kind of light, but it was still dark in the uh, room where we had the service. Uh, and the nuns were chanting. Boy, did they chant! Was it beautiful listening to the nuns just do the service? But this area, look, look at the, that. That's one of the monasteries there, right there. That picture, it's not as clear as it is on my iPhone. I took it on my iPhone. I took that from the bus as I was going by. I got this perfect picture. Um, I had a friend in my house, and it's much clearer, but the transfer I here, I think that's clear. But this whole area was covered by water. And that's that's what caused this mountain, this growth, it's like the Grand Canyon. And it's just, just incredible just to see what they had out there. But uh, that, that visual and the love of the nuns made this the greatest stop to start our program with uh, in Mount Athens. So we all, we could have stayed there several days, but we didn't have time, we had to move on. Uh, the monastery was St. Stephen's Monastery, and that's what it looks like inside. What you're going to see on all these monasteries is how well they're taken care of. There was, there was a couple that we saw in Mount Athens that were being rebuilt. Some had been burnt down and they were rebuilding them. But look at the cleanliness, look at the spot. It's, it's perfect. Everything is in its right place. Uh, uh, when, when they have food for you, it's, it's, you walk and there it is. It's already set out perfectly in its place. Uh, there, there's no trash. I didn't see any trash anywhere. You could have eaten off the ground in these places. They're all well kept and, and very, uh, I'm not going to say modern, but, but 
you wouldn't mind living in any of these places. They're very well taken care of. And again, these are just nuns here now in this one. Okay. Uh, if you want to know how high up it was, that gives you an indication of what we had to do. We could, the bus would go just so far, and we would have to travel walking up. Of course, that's our bishop there. That's Mike Ross, if anybody knows him, the chanter from Wilmington. Uh, just give you an idea of the height. There, that's that roadway we walked up. Right? This is not the St. Stephen's Monastery, by the way. This is another one that we saw afterwards. Uh, but uh, they had things on pulleys. They pull things up from down to, to, to do the repairs or to bring food up. It makes it kind of easier. They, they got the, right over there. That's a pulley system that they had in one of these places. Drop straight down. They just pull things up and have it up there. And uh, they have a lot of guests. People go like we did. And uh, uh, when we go to Mount Athos, when we went to Mount Athos, nothing came out of our pocket. Uh, now we, we ended up buying in the bookstores and in the shops, and we tried to offer uh, money on our own, making donations. Um, it was really interesting here. Uh, at the end, uh, we were just so moved. It happened to be our first stop, to our first big monastery stop. So we were just all of us were so impressed with it. Uh, we, they asked me to collect money for them, not the nuns, the people that I was traveling with, asked that uh, you know, I collect and give them a donation. They have this uh, fund that they take care of the children in the valley down there that, that don't have homes or whatever. So we did collect, we collected a lot of money. Uh, you know, I didn't give any now, but they were offered to uh, put a restricted amount. I said, just whatever you want to give me. I ended up with $500. And I went up to the Gerardisa. Uh, and I got her a private, and she just had this beautiful smile. And I said, you know, I, I have this money. I want, we want to give you something. Um, and when she saw the money, she goes, in brief, she said, little ball. And she said, I, I can't take it. I'm ashamed. No. And her, her smile left and said, no, 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 you can't take money. I said, we have to give something. We want to give something. She said, you're our guest. No. She, she fought me on taking the money. And that, that's, that's their nature. That's how they treat us. Uh, I... Eventually got the money, got her to take the money when I said to use it for the children, for her program. She took the money for that, okay? She would not take it for the hospitality. She said, for that, you know, I'll use it, she thanked me. The smile came back on her face. But wonderful, wonderful people. That's the view now, okay? Just in case you're wondering how high up it is. Look at it now. It's just beautiful. And uh, there's, there's monasteries here. I can't see the, in this one. Is there one here? There's the picture I took. All right, well. We're moving on. <laughs> this is Thessalonica. Okay, and I wanted to show you this because this, this had a very, very uh, interesting spot. Is there anybody, uh, any Jimmy's here? Demetrius? Do I have any? Nobody here. Okay. Uh, Thessalonica happens to have the, uh, the, the site of many famous uh, saints. St. Saint Gregory Palamas is there. St. Demetrius is there. This is the church of St. Demetrius. Uh, and in this church, this church is built over the place that he was that he was martyred. So you can go down into the cave where he was, he was martyred. So let's go down into the cave. And before you get down, you go into the church. And on the left, uh, now this is uh, two pictures, but this would be somewhere right in this area. Okay, so off on the side. That's actually the relics of uh, St. Demetrius. That's the, the skull there, and that, that is the rest of his, uh, his uh, uh, relics. Um, one of the, the inspiring things here is that this coffin that you see there, that's the sarcophagus, continually produces myrrh from the casket. Okay? And, I, and I, this sounds crazy. Now, a lot of these things I'm going to tell you sound crazy. That's why you have to go on this trip so you can see. You can see, uh, and I, I didn't take a picture of it, but they actually downstairs have tombs that run from these things into like a, 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 a vat to collect the dripping of the myrrh, and the tube is connected to the casket. And the myrrh is coming from inside the casket. And they gave us, they, they, were, they gave us each our own little package of uh, myrrh to bring home, um, and the smoke will not go away. It's there. Every, every time I, I open up my little container, it's there in the cotton that they, they gave us. But this miracle goes on continually, right in front of your face when you go and, and you, you see this place. And it's directly above the spot. That is the spot underneath the church that uh, you can take the tour down there. 
where St. Demetrius was uh, martyred, right in there. This is the cave. This is a prison. Actually, they put him in there. It's it goes in a little bit. It originally had bars. But uh, this is where they say he was actually slaughtered. They found the traces of, of uh, I don't know what traces they found. But this is in the archaeology, they found that this is the spot that he was actually killed. So it's uh, you know, as many times as we've sung the hymns to St. Demetrius and we follow St. Demetrius, it, it was a meat bumping event to stand at the very spot that, that he was martyred. And then they go upstairs and get the uh, mirror. So then we went to the Metropolis Cathedral in Thessalonica, it's just like our Atlanta, and the uh, Metropolitan was wonderful there, and we went to the, the, the Metropolis Cathedral there, and there were the relics of St. Gregory Palamas. Yeah, we just finished a few months ago. Uh, his day, right, to bring Lent, that, that Sunday that we sang the hymns to, and there he was. Uh, we got to venerate him, that's him in the background there. And uh, these are the type of things that are right there just visually, you know, walk in and see and venerate. So, we were getting very, very um, emotionally ready for Mount Athos. Now, to go to Mount Athos, the first thing you have to do, let's see, uh, this is just the introduction. We, you have to get a visa to go to Mount Athos. Father has his here today, too. We, we've got a copy of the visa that I had. I eventually want to frame this. I don't know why. I just think it's something to frame. I want to get rid of it. But uh, it's like you're leaving another country. You've got to get permission from the government of uh, Mount Athos to come there, and they do have a government. They um, they are not technically part of, of Greece, all right? They, they are an isolated island. They've been given that jurisdiction from an edict that was written way, way back, about a thousand years ago, but they can't find a copy of it, all right? Uh, but they said it was written by, and I forgot the emperor's name who did it this time, but uh, it is separate from Greece, and that's how it operates independently. Okay, so let's see here. So we're going to go to the Holy Mountain now. Now, I already gave you a brief history of it, uh, some information. Uh, this is the uh, map of it. I'm going to show you a better one shortly. Uh, the women, if you notice here, it changes color. See, it's sort of like a white tan over here. It's a green. This is Greece. This is not Greece. Okay, that's that's the break point. Over here, right over here, you see how thin the land is. Um, Xerxes, 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 Xerxes uh, built a canal in there during, uh, you know, he was attacking uh, uh, Athens and that area and so forth. So there is a canal in that spot because it's a small spot. But once you cross that canal, uh, then you're, you're really into this peninsula. This is one of three peninsulas, uh, and I'll show you shortly. I just want to give you a visual here. Uh, when the Virgin Mary landed, she landed right over here. This is Ibira, the parish of Ibira. Uh, we stayed at uh, Baco Pedi, which is right over here. Uh, the women stayed at Oranopoli, which is right there. There was a monastery in Oranopoli. Women, unfortunately, are not allowed on the island. Why are women not allowed on the island? Um, <clears throat> it's got nothing to do with, um, uh, uh, to, to say, you know, it's not like, you know, I hate getting into the subject because it, it's so difficult to try and explain some of these things. But um, in this case, women, uh, like in the nuns, the, the monastery that I just showed you, St. Stephen's, no, there, no men are amongst there. It's just the nuns. Okay? So uh, each has its own uh, you know, policy, and in mount, uh, you know, monasteries you know, are either male monasteries or, or they're female. And so the fact that on Mount Athos, you've got all monasteries there. That's all Mount, Ath mount Athos is. All right. If there are homes there, they're just temporary homes for people to stay while they're visiting, to build places there, to bring food, whatever. So they have some homes there that are owned by each of the monasteries, but there, there are no townhouses that you can go and visit. There's no downtown there. It's, it's a different environment. And they choose not to have women as part of their environment. All right? That's the reason why. It's not anything, someone told me there was a, a story of the, uh, the Virgin Mary, their book was saying that women could not go there. That's not so. Um, at least I couldn't find that. I could only, uh, and no one could tell me that when I was talking to them on Mount Athos. But the body you know, only asked that 
it be her item, that, that she would be uh, given it uh, as her garden. And she became very influential. It took a different direction because of that, the fact that she was there. But um, that, that had nothing to do with the exclusivity of just the males on there. But it even included um, animals. Right? The, the, the animals, are, uh, I still can't figure out how to get their eggs. <laughs> Did they bring them in? <laughs> they, no, they, have, they, have. they have female the, the chickens in there. I think they, they loosened up maybe a little bit on the animals. But originally, the original doctor said no, no, uh, no female. Uh, they don't have any kind. They don't need me uh, ever. Uh -huh. So there's no real need for animals. Uh, if they back when, if they need, if they needed uh, animals for you know a, a, a beast of burden, they would only have uh, male animals. They would bring only male animals uh, for I think obvious reasons. Is that uh, they could. Be a distraction uh, to support the monks and to their um, their spirit of trouble. You know, I think that's that's the strongest reason, and, and that's all it is. It's got nothing to do uh, theologically with uh, women not being allowed on there or whatever. Uh, but they do try to accommodate that by having this monastery just right outside, which is very interesting. I wish I had a chance to go see it because uh, yeah, you weren't there, that right? Did you, did you find it? You found that interesting, right? Very enjoyable. Okay. We'll have to do a presentation just on the okay. So, <clears throat> all right, this, and I'm going to show you where it is in Greece here. That's not such a good map. I got a better map later. But the area that we're talking about is right off of here. There's three little pieces sticking out there. I thought that would be more visible, but it's not. Um, like I said, I've got a better shot coming up a little bit later. That's the actual. Um, uh, physically what it looks like, and uh, we already went through that. There's the canal that I was talking about. Uh, this is the closest island right off of here, right about there, is, is where my father was born, Nimbus. Not many people know the island of but that's my background. Mitilini, which is a little further over. Mitilini is right over here, but the big one right by them is Nimbus. Uh, okay. okay, there's a picture of uh, the, the mythological god Athos. Uh, so I've already gone through that and given you the origins of the name. And there's that picture that was kind of about a little more clear. This is Mount Athos. You see how it's just distinct in its color and so forth. AG, Idea Orders. Um, Vakopedi is where we're going to stay. Uh, there's Oranopoli where the women went. And uh, we stayed right here the first time when we came from Thessalonica, which is here. We went to Gavala, uh, Thessalonica. Came down this way, went to Chubby. Uh, yeah, came over this way. We went to, uh, and that's pronounced Irisurus. Uh, and it's a very nice hotel. Um, and that was our view from the window. I just thought I'd show you. That's one of the peninsulas you're looking at. Now Athos is behind us in this case. Right. Um, I put this picture in here. I did give you the history of Constantine the Great being. Um, Actually, you know, not the founder, but he was, he was the earliest recorded person on there, other than the Virgin Mary, with the, that we have in history. And um, I tried, I, I, the one one of the regrets I have is that I didn't take the picture when I was in the altar of Father Betty. One of the, the incredible things that the bishop did for us, uh, we were getting ready for service, and he came out, he saw a couple of us sitting there, and he asked us, he said, to follow him. We went back and took us behind the altar. And you talk about magnificent relics, incredible relics. Um, this icon is Constantine and Hel uh, Constantine and Helen. Uh, it's the cross. You know, Helen found the cross of the um, of Christ, the original cross. And so you see this icon. Uh, you know, it's in our church somewhere. It, it's all over. <coughs> right behind the altar. Just like in our altar, the altar boys pick up the cross and they have the accepted on the side, right in the middle of the cross. Right in the middle of the altar of Vatopedi is the original piece. And it looks exactly like that icon. And I, I was just so... Uh, I, I just lost it. I saw it. I couldn't believe it because, you know, all the history I thought about constantly great. There I'm standing right there and I couldn't even touch it. I touched that with the cross that he was holding. But that's exactly what it looks like, and uh, I understand that icon now. Like I said, uh, even though I think it's symbolic of, 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 of Helen finding the cross of uh, the crucifixion, but obviously that's too small to crucify anybody on. And there is this cross. So um, 
when you go, I hope uh, you, you know, the next time we go, if you join us, that's one spot the bishops want to take us to. You didn't get back there. Did you get? Well, you were back there the whole time. Right? So you saw that. Yeah. It wasn't uh, the original. It wasn't the original? No, the original had been taken apart and, and pieces had been sent to different parts of the empire um, to keep it. So the Vatani has a, the largest piece of the original cross. Which one? Okay, but but this was that smaller cross that was behind it. This is another cross of the um, the way the bishop explained it to me. He said this is the cross uh, that Constantine had. But it was not the original cross of the crucifixion. No, no, it wasn't the cross of the crucifixion. Oh, it belonged, no. it belonged to Constantine. It belonged to Constantine. He said no, it wasn't the cross. Of the, it was it was. It, I mean, my hand went around the base of this cross. It's actually. It actually looked like what I showed you that was up there. It was intact. Um, but he said it was Constantine's cross, not, not the crucifixion cross. Right? Okay, this is Vapopedi. Vapopedi is an interesting name. Um, Theodosius, uh, and I, I'm assuming this is the Theodosius, but the time period is the same, uh, that built the walls around uh, Constantinople, the emperor Theodosius. He had a son, and his name escapes me, but we're going to see it a little bit later. Arcadius, I think it was, um, and they were traveling in the sea and uh, away from uh, Mount Athos, and a storm overthrew this um, uh, the ship they were on, and they lost their son, uh, Arcadius, and miraculously they found him uh, at a spot that is now called Vatopedi. They found him in a bramble bush there. Alive, and so they uh, named it. The, the uh, uh, Vato means a, a bush, some type of a, a bush that's located in that area. That they is child, so that's how they got the name Vato Bed uh, in honor of uh, the miracle that this young uh, child was saved. And they believe the Virgin Mary carried and saved the child. So that's why that became a sacred spot. And that was, uh, like I say, that final building, uh, uh, the final site was uh, developed around 950 AD. And it's a picture of it. And it's magnificent. Uh, you know, it's a dual building, right? Almost every place you went to is doing a lot of building, a lot of construction, a lot of development. Um, this, they've got their own port here. It's just, just a, a what can I tell you, beautiful area. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna, yeah, I think I covered all that. So there's a little details that uh, I think I've already mentioned. Um, there are 20 monasteries there, 20 of the ones that I just, like Vato Bedi, that size. Um, each one of these, especially Vato Bedi, has many tributary little, little areas that uh, develop their own monasteries that are attached to. Okay, They call these skeets. You may see, you may have seen this a lot. I don't know. You see it every time you order stuff from the skeet. Have you ever seen that? that uh, I've seen the books in here from that area. Skeet is a a, a small monastery that's attached to a larger one. So Patopedi um, is one of the larger ones. It's one of the earlier ones. Uh, the first one was the uh, Great Lava, it's called. And then you've got Iberon, Patopedi. Actually, Patopedi is listed as second Iberon. The Onesis, I think, and there's a fourth, fifth one. Do I have it up there? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, uh, those are the first four uh, that, that were established. So, uh, one other is added to that. Five of them run the government of the area. The government is in a place called Cariés, and we're going to go there shortly, too. We'll show you that. Uh, but. Uh, the decisions and everything that are made in this one central area, which is right almost in the middle of uh, Mount Athos. Uh, how did I get this? Oh, that's one of the icons. This is one of the famous icons uh, that we did not see that you saw, right? This is the Port uh, Piazza. I put this here because it's an icon we see all the time, and um, it has a really interesting story to it. Uh, so if you go to the Viron, this is the icon that you see in the churches an awful lot. You're free to look at this and uh, you know, I'll pass it around, but I want to explain it first because I guarantee you, you'll miss it. You've seen this icon all the time 
And you probably have missed the most significant part of it, or one of the significant parts of this. I'm going to point that out to you now. But that's the uh, original one. It's a miraculous icon. Uh, you can't go to any of the 56 monasteries there and not see a miraculous icon or a miraculous something. They, they all have uh, historical evidence of, of things that, that have happened there. Uh, this one in particular was one, like I started to tell you, that during the iconoclastic period, they hid it. Um, uh, the woman who had it uh, uh, threw it into the uh, ocean uh, rather than let the, the uh, infidels take it and destroy it and so forth. So she threw it in the ocean. And uh, right outside, it was right outside a, a veil when this happened. And uh, one day the monks saw this light, a flame coming down like from the sky, almost like a torch pointing straight down to a little spot. Got a picture of that? Yeah, there it is. A little light that had come down, this is, this is an ocean here. And um, when the monks got close with their robots, they saw it was that icon it was floating in the water. So they went to pick up the boat, or the uh, icon, and they couldn't get close to it. Every time they got close, they got pushed away, got close again, pushed away. They could not get to the icon. And then the uh, one night as the head abbot was sleeping, he had a dream. The Virgin Mary came to him. She comes and intercedes all the time, okay, on this island. Uh, she came and told uh, the, the elder that Gabriel, Mount Gabriel, had to come out to the water, had to walk on the water on his knees, and she would, he would be able to get the icon. Uh, for those of you who remember the stories at Christmas, Gabriel is a very famous name for, a very cherished name for the Virgin Mary, because Gabriel is the angel, that the archangel that, that uh, communicated with Mary during the Christmas stories and so forth. So Gabriel, that's the, the monk Gabriel there, crawled on his knees and was able to crawl on the water, got out and brought the icon back. So in celebration, they put this icon in this church, in the monastery, and the next day when they came back, it wasn't there, it was gone. So they went to look for it again, and they found it at the gate, the entryway of a uh, So they took it from there and went back and put it in the altar again, and the next day, it was gone. So they got the picture that uh, the icon did not want to go to the altar. So they left it at the gate, and that's where it took the name, or Theatisa, which means the gatekeeper. So when you see it in Greek, it's all, it has the word what the other side. All these icons that look similar are all slightly different, and they all have a history, and they all list, you know, they write on there what the history, what the, the name of the icon is, and the relevance of that history. Now the interesting thing, as though everything I said so far about the icon wasn't interesting, but the real interesting thing is that uh, when it was invaded by the Turks, <laughs> they came and went through the gate, or tried to go through the gate, and they couldn't pass the gate. And all they saw was this icon at the gate. Okay. Uh, word got back to the head the Turk who was attacking them. And he got very upset. Actually, they were pirates, uh, they said. They got very upset. He got very upset. And he took his sword and he charged him. He said, where's this icon? They pointed it out to him. And he took his sword and put it into the face of the icon. And the icon bled. And you probably never noticed the slash blood on the Virgin Mary. So um, we'll pass that one around and that is the miracle of that icon. It's one of the more famous. Uh, if there are top five things, things on that island, uh, there it is, uh, the peninsula of Mount Athos, that icon is one of them. And again, that is a reinterpretation of the one, the original one you've seen up here. Okay. So we'll move on now. Can I, yeah. I, can I add it? We were able to visit the Iran icon, uh, the monastery, and part of the story that the monk told us as we were before the icon, he said, when Gabriel retrieved the icon, he came onto the land and then set the icon down on a rock, and the rock split, and water started coming out, he said, just like Moses in the rock. And so they built the chapel on this rock that's still to this day flowing water, and that's considered holy water. So. Um, that was pretty special to be able to, to actually drink from the rock. And then legend says that um, that when the icon leaves the gate, that'll be the final of the end time. And um, so, you know, being the the uh, conspiracy theorists that we are, we we're trying to weasel in how we would ask, you know, when when what do they think about the icon leaving the gate? 
So we, as we, we ended up walking out of um, Ibaran, uh Monastery, and I turned to the monk, uh, a tall gentleman, spoke very well English, and I said, so when is she going to leave the gate? And he turned to me and he goes, we don't worry about such things. We worry about whether she leaves your heart. So that was pretty neat. Mm. Is, is the other kind at the gate? They built a chapel around it, okay. so it doesn't appear to be at the gate. It's actually in a chapel. Okay, the chapel at the gate. Was or the by gate. the gate. Yeah. Okay, interesting. This is Father Petty. Okay, this is just as we entered into uh, Father Petty. We're there now. And um, bell tower there. The uh, I'm standing by the dormitories. They have beautiful dormitories. Uh, this is the center of town. I tried to match up two pictures. I did pretty good. It's pretty close. It almost looks like one picture. Uh, but this is one building here. This is the slice of the picture, but that's one building. So it, it gives you a good idea of what the courtyard is like. This is the church. You'll see that in a second. And this is the eating area. This is where they all go and eat. Uh, they do a lot of going to church and they do a lot of going over there to eat. They go back and forth from the area. They keep it very convenient. And we'll talk about the eating shortly. I just wanted to show you the general scope of it, uh, the buildings. Let me go back to the previous one here. Buildings are surrounded like that. There are buildings on, on this side, all the way around, like that. Those are, those are housing areas, dormitories, uh, very well kept, very colorful, almost a little bit like this in world, uh, colored and so forth. Uh, these are all steps, and these are a bear to go down at four o'clock in the morning to go to the chapel. So uh, we, were, we were doing some careful walking down the steps, but it's very hard to see. Uh, but uh, Early morning services were, were really interesting. I, our father, we were talking here, and father had mentioned that uh, uh, you know when we got there, the very first thing was that we went to a, a vigil. Uh, it was like an all supposed to. They called it an all night vigil. That's what the word got to us. It wasn't all night. That was an exaggeration. It went from four o'clock to one o'clock. It wasn't all night. You know, uh, but the interesting thing was, it could have been five minutes. To me. It, it, you know. I, believe me, the time did not stand still. There. The time it was not, we sat in the front row. They insisted that they we sit up in the front. We did that. Uh, we're going to go inside the church in here. Let me jump ahead uh, so that uh, you see what I'm talking about here. This is the kitchen area. That was that building I showed you on the right. Uh, kitchen area. We're standing for a prayer. It's a very long uh, piece over here. That's just there to show you. They, they everything they do there. Uh, they do themselves. The candles are theirs. I, I don't know if they have ever bring in candles. I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the monsters do. But they try and make everything. I know they make their candles there. They make their. Uh, they have. The, they're world famous for their uh, the vine that uh, you know, came out for the, uh, the scents and incense. And this is a wine vat. They do, they do their own wine. And boy, do they have wonderful liqueurs. Every monastery uh, we went to, the first thing we got was this nice little liqueur. Uh, each one had their own flavor, their own design, and it was uh, very, very nice. Oh, yeah. When you go from the church to the, uh, when they open the doors for lunch, or, there's only two meals there, okay, you eat twice, and it's not a lunch, like, you know, it's two full meals. There's no breakfast necessarily, although one of the meals is early in the morning. Uh, then there's the next big meal. Uh, you walk in, the food is all on the table, waiting for you already. It's all set up. This is at the end of one of the meals, and that's why things are a little uh, out of place there. But the food is is incredible. Delicious food, fresh food, and fish. Uh, they don't eat meat, but they have fish. We did eat uh, wonderful grilled fish. Vegetables like uh, I've never seen before. I don't even know what some of them were, but well, they were they were excellent. Did you, were your meals good? Yeah, the guy said the meals were good. Uh, there's our uh, metropolitan there. That's the the. the at that time, that was the highest ranking guy. I think the, the head of uh, Ephraim, the monk, uh, was not there. Uh, he was in Russia with the belt of the Virgin Mary. They cut the belt that I was telling you about into three sections, and each of one section went to Russia. And uh, I heard that there, they said that the, uh, two million people came out to see and venerate the, the, the belt of the Virgin Mary. But this is the head area. Uh, this is where the, the, the head monk would sit, and there are any guests, especially our bishop, uh, you know, would be sitting there. We sat 
pretty close to the front. As a matter of fact, the uh, picture I just showed you, that's our group right there. So, yeah, that's Terry Stratos, I think, right there. Okay, you all from our community. And uh, that's what it looks like when you go to sit down. It's all laid out for you. You just you start, and you have to start right away because you only have 15 minutes to eat. There's no talking. It's it's quite a, uh, an interesting thing. There's absolutely no talking there. Uh, and what they have is you see back here. That's like a a, 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 a pulpit. That's a pulpit where they read the psalms or whatever readings of the day are read. And so everybody just eats. And you listen to their, their readings, right? Almost like what Father Seraphim does, whenever you listen to what well, does for us for on Saint Anne is a, you know during a holy week, the week before Holy Week, they does the reading here. Uh, it's very similar. It's a very uh, comfortable environment to eat, to enjoy, but you're not rushed. But you don't, you have no time to sit back and relax or anything like that. They are extremely, extremely busy on the Atlas. Uh, this is the bell of the Virgin Mary, okay, right there. That's what it's carried, and this is what Father carried uh, during the service for, for the processional that um, that he had the honor of carrying. That uh, it's a magnificent story about the bell. There's actually a, a, a historical record for this uh, bell. Uh, this is the icon of that bell. You can see the Virgin Mary uh, elevated. And that's the bell. That she is giving somebody, that is uh, St. Thomas. History is reported that St. Thomas had this belt. Now, um, the church knows why St. Thomas had the belt, and it's because it's part of our uh, theology that um, on the, uh, the Assumption Day of the Virgin Mary, uh, August 15th, um, all, the disciples, all the apostles were taken by the Holy Spirit and brought to her to her uh, deathbed. Okay. And that's because she asked her son, this is what she wanted. She wanted to know when she was going to die. She wanted to prepare for it. She's excited about joining her, her son. And she wanted all the, all her children, which were the disciples, the apostles. Uh, everyone showed up because the Holy Spirit brought them up there. Our, our tradition teaches us that, that they, they were carried by the Holy Spirit, brought to this uh, place on August 8th, which was the Garden of Gethsemane. And everyone but the Thomas. And they, they uh, put the Mary into a, a, a cave in uh, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure, I read one account said three days later, I read I thought another one said uh, 40 days later. Sometime later, St. Thomas was picked up by the Holy Spirit and brought to this spot, to this grave spot of the Virgin Mary. And he had no idea why he was brought there. Uh, he saw the other apostles, and they explained to him that the Virgin Mary had fallen asleep. Uh, he was very upset that he didn't, you know, witness that they, he wasn't there for that day. He was kind of confused. But they said, "Well, look, we'll take you to the spot, and you can, you can, uh, you know, venerate, uh, you know, and say your respects to the Holy Mother." So they went back to the Garden of Gethsemane. They opened it up, the cave, and uh, so they opened the crypt, and she, the body was not there. Okay, and our belief is that she ascended. That's not a dog by the church, by the way. It's, it's, but it's, it's our belief that, that that's what happened on that day. And uh, they looked around for Thomas, and they couldn't figure out why it was empty, and they couldn't find Thomas. Actually, they looked up in the sky, and Thomas was being elevated. And when he came down, he had this belt. And he said he saw the Virgin Mary ascend it to heaven, and it was the last thing the Virgin Mary had given her. This belt on about the belly is used, they, well, what they do with it, they, they take ribbons, actually anything, but primarily they take this ribbon and they put it over the belt and they package it. Uh, His Eminence had given me uh, some of these things to give some people that uh, were in need because uh, it has produced miracles. Uh, just just the, the touching of the belt has produced miracles uh, for people. So. Uh, this has become the thing with, with this little uh, uh, sash that's, that's there. Um, when we went, we saw, and I didn't take a picture of it because I was, I was overwhelmed with what was happening. Uh, there was a table there, they had the, the belt, they actually didn't touch it. Uh, you know, they, they couldn't lift it out of the, the uh, case, but uh, I, I did, I, I actually put my hand on it. I had just bought this icon in the bookstore, and the monk, 
priest that we you know, saw me carrying it, and he took it from me. And he took it and he placed it on top of the belt of the Virgin Mary. So it's become a very, very special icon for me. And it's something that I get to see every day. But these are the type of things that happen when you go to places like this. They, they, they do everything they can to, to lift you spiritually. Okay, and, and this was one of those magic moments for me, one of those spiritual moments. <laughs> this is the port again, this is all about the Bede, and this is how we, we left. We're going to go see some other things that are there now. Uh, it was cloudy most of the time. We didn't have really pretty, and it's November, you know, it's not really green or anything, but it was still, it had its own beauty, it had an internal beauty. But we went to Carrier next. Now, that's the government area that I was telling you about. That's like in the center of the town. And that is the center of the town right there. It's a bell tower. And we're going to go to our third grade, or our second grade, our third grade story of icons now. The government building, this is the government building. This is the headquarters. And this is a church right over here. I've got a better shot of it. Now a little bit later. This is the uh, government uh, boardroom, okay? And again, as I mentioned, that's the, the five seats of uh, the, the five uh, bigger. Monasteries, the older monasteries, about the Bedi and Dero, all that group I mentioned, govern this area. They change leadership every, uh, I'm not sure it was every couple of years or something like that. I don't recall I mean, how often well they change the leadership. But one person becomes like the, the you know, I'm not going to call him president, but the, the head guy that pulls everything together for the meetings and so forth. Uh, but there's there's no there's no power there. They, they, they really you know, make sure that, that it doesn't become, you know, a president of power, somebody who can take charge, stuff like that. Uh, they all handle, they all work towards running the government. And it's lasted for a thousand years, so, um, you know, it works for them. And that's the border, and there's our metropolitan stand there. But it's a huge, beautiful border. And this is, uh, all right, this is me standing on the steps right over here, just taking a shot, looking out. That's the whole town, the whole area of Gagye, it's the monastery of Gagye. So, uh, this is the church. Again, if there, I just took the picture on this side. I turned around right in front of me now, standing on the steps of the government building. It's the church of the uh, uh, Oxygen of Steam. Um, and this is another famous uh, icon. And this is, a, like I said, there's about five things that are really, really famous compared to that. Now, Atlas, this is one of them. <laughs> the Oxygen of Steam is the hymn we sing every Sunday in church. Truly, it is proper to all the human blessed. You know, this is right after, uh, we, after we're kneeling, right? Yeah, right after we're, we're done our kneeling, I think we stand up. And we, we sing this prayer, we do it, or this hymn. We do it every Sunday. Uh, Father Seraphim, with Father Seraphim, of course, we, we have a be beautiful Byzantine version that, that we do. And um, if you look at the, the music, if you get the musical scores of it, you'll find that there's no chronographer. There's nobody listed who wrote it. <clears throat> this icon, which you see all the time now, and that's this one that I have here that I'm going to pass around in a minute if I explain the story. That's the version of the one you see up there. This is the this modern version. And there are many versions of it, but they all have Jesus Christ holding the scroll. Okay, they all have Christ holding the scroll. And uh, we start passing that around, and I'm going to explain it to you. Um, there was this evening where the monk, one of the monks, uh, were, were doing services, uh, you know, they're always in prayer. And the head elder asked this one junior monk to stay in his, uh, in the smaller chapel, wherever he was to uh, venerate the Virgin Mary, while the others were away in this bigger chapel for whatever reason. Uh, this is something that they have there, that uh, actually I read, but I didn't see this there. Okay. I, it was in some of the research that I've done. But this goes back to the uh, early, early 1900s, like 1903, somewhere around that time. There's a gathering of these monks. Remember now, no women are on this island, this peninsula. And they were passing out on the it was like after church, and, and they, they were playing with their new toy, this camera, and somebody uh, whose name was Gabriel <laughs> took this picture. Okay? And this is the picture. And this is the person that wasn't there when the man took the picture. That's a woman there. And several monks said they saw that woman there earlier in the week, and it was the Virgin Mary. So 
this is the claim on this picture that somebody actually captured the image of the Virgin Mary being humbled, taking a piece of a vidro from the service. And there's a woman, and it's a very famous picture according to what I read. But I just thought I'd share that with you. These are the type of things that you find on the lapels, all right? Uh, this is a skeet, right? Now, skeet is, a, is attached to a monastery, and this is attached to the monastery of uh, uh, Patopedi. And you see, they're big. This is a beautiful one. This is a, they're all beautiful, but th this is a real beautiful place. It's uh, Russian oriented. It's got the, and uh, actually, it's got it's, the Russians operate this one, right? Or do uh, they not? Is it Greek? It belongs to uh, the Pepe, you said the Greek. Yeah, but, but they said it was a Russian. Uh, All skis were built by the Russian church. Okay. And what most were abandoned at the time of the uh, Soviet Union. What does that word mean? What is a ski? It's, it's, a, it's technically, it's not a, it's the same as a monastery. It's a, a ski, it means that it has a large uh, a cathedral in the center and, you know, sort of a smaller area around. Uh, I'm not sure whether what the, the meaning is, but it's a little bit in Russian. Now, this is the Church of St. Andrew, in that seat. Um, it, it is so impressive, their their that they have there. They're, they're just, you can just stand there and just study them all day long. They're magnificent. This is all uh, ornamented with gold, I don't know if it's just gold paint or, or whatever, but it, it just, just humbles you to look at something like this. And um, this is a picture of it uh, a little further back, just see the size of it. And this is the altar, and I told you that it has three chapels inside. Okay, three altars, there's one, there's two, and there's three. That's all within the back of this, that's how big that altar is. Uh, here you go. That's how big this is, okay? And this is dedicated to uh, the brother of uh, uh, St. Peter, St. Andrew. This is Kero Kodam, Kero Kodam, Kero Kodam, how do you pronounce it? Kero Kodam, Kero Kodam. You may see this someday soon. <laughs> Father asked me to take a picture of that. Uh, I took a separate picture of it. And, uh, because he's looking for things to build in our courtyard, we, we sort of like that design, so we just took that. This is us entering uh, that uh, monastery. Gary, can I, can I yes, add on St. Andrews real quick? Mm -hmm. uh, that monastery, uh, oh, actually, the Ski to St. Andrews, that chapel, is, it's incredible. It's one of the largest Orthodox chapels in the world. It was abandoned, I don't remember when, but for a period of time in the 70s, just recently, and we talked to a, a Finnish monk who was there when they came back. It was a Russian ski, and then the Greek Brotherhood came back and occupied it. He said that in its ornate gold, and you saw the icons are just incredibly beautiful. And and it was abandoned. We asked him how how could it have been. He said when they opened up the doors, it was as you see it now. It was just con con preserved. And we said how could it have survived? such a long period of time without any care, he said it was a miracle. He said that the floor, however, was covered n a number of inches of, of this fungus, weird stuff, and they had to scrub it and scrub it and scrub it, and you can see it's just absolutely gorgeous wooden floors, and that's basically what all they had to do is clear the floor, and then the rest of it, God had miraculously preserved the floor. For and it's, it's, it's those three chapels, the first, the center one is St. Andrew. The one, I believe, on the left is the chapel of Mary Magdalene. And then the, the right so, one is another female saint that w went in Russia, to, uh, went through Russia. But it's just like Gary was saying, it's really kind of, it's mind-boggling. But there's an, another miraculous thing that happened there. Thank you. Uh, the seal of the Byzantine Empire, uh, just pointing out that the, the, the doc, the, uh, they all, uh, you know, report, not report, but, you know, this is all under the sea of the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople. He visits there often and so forth. That's why you'll find the seal of the Byzantine Empire uh, there throughout. Okay, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to move on. This is the one place, this is the one father. Do you want to take a guess? I, we can't figure out where I took that picture. Um, it's Holy Relics. Uh, and magnificent relics. 
That's the finger of uh, St. Andrew. You've got uh, the skull, I think, of uh, St. Carabos. You've got the foot of someone. It's either it's sort of Madame or St. Andrew. But I, 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 don't, I don't think it was St. Andrew. No, no, it wasn't St. Andrew's. It wasn't St. Andrew's. Or are you talking? Okay. So, uh, they have, in this one parish, that we, uh, one monastery, the largest piece of the cross. All right, and it's in uh, uh, this parish that Sarah Potami that, that I'm just showing you. Uh, but we couldn't go that day. They brought down a piece of the cross to show us, but we couldn't go where the, the large piece was because they were rebuilding it. But, uh, they do. They all have. This is nothing. I mean, they all have cross like this everywhere you go. You're venerating and in the presence of, of the saints. We must have seen you realize. We actually saw a skull in Bantopedi with the ear still on there, frozen in the stone light uh, of uh, St. John Chrysostom. Okay. It's, it's amazing. <coughs> All right, so we want to move on. Um, this is my favorite picture. This is kind of funny. You see Father Stephen smiling over there. Okay, I just wanted to see to make sure that you see that he was there with us. All right. You notice the, the empty seat there. It's kind of interesting. The, this is the Metropolitan of Thessalonica. He's asking the bishop, who's that other priest sitting on the other side? <laughs> um, Father's got a smile on his face. But when they, when uh, you, you talk of humility, you know, the, the Lord teaches us that, uh, this. This Metropolitan is such a lovable, wonderful person. And I believe that, that our Metropolitan is equally as lovable and wonderful person. And when they walked, in, when he, uh, when we walked in, they wanted to give our Metropolitan a seat of honor there, and he couldn't take it. And he said, "No, no, you sit there." He went to the Metropolitan of Thessalonica. The Metropolitan of Thessalonica is like six foot four. He said, "No, no, no, you take it." And they actually grabbed their arms, like, and they started to push this way, then they started to push that way, and they started actually doing a dance, and we, we just started laughing. It just looked so funny. And these two Metropolitans fighting this over there. So neither one sat. <laughs> and left it open. My father's still laughing because he thought it was fine. Uh, I'm going to close with one last thing. I can read it. That's the last picture. This was given to us. We got gifts all over the place. Everywhere we went, somebody gave us a gift. Thanks. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, I'm going to read it to you. Just to give you an idea of the, who's there, what they're doing for us. This is called the hymn of love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long, and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not its own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoice not in, in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hope all things, endure all things, love never fails. It's Corinthians 13. So this is the mentality of the people that we were with for those magnificent uh, 10 days that we spent in the day of the night. Father, you You know, I'm not um, particularly keen on monasticism. I, I mean, I'm not a promoter of monasticism, but I, I love, you know, going to the monastery. Um, you know, when I was there, uh, of course, you know, that I'm diabetic, I'm on uh, insulin, and I, I check my insulin level uh, every day, and during the, twice a day, and during the trip, um, you know, we were you know, walking around a lot, but whenever we were um, in, in, you know, in Greece or in Istanbul, you know, my sugar levels were about the same, but when we were on Mount Anthos, um, I never, for three days, took any insulin, and my, my blood sugars were perfect. Um, you know, I, I, I can only uh, say that it's a miracle because 
but it's not that as though we weren't eating. We were uh, eating very well. Um, and uh, okay, even sweets, you know, because with every meal they would have like a, you know, like cream puffs or, you know, these wrapped up, you know, chocolate things like Greek version of ding dongs or something, you know. And, um, and, and I never, um, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't eat any meals while I was at my office. Now when we got back, and, you know, that evening we checked my blood sugar and it was where it would normally be, um, you know, so that I could use insulin again. Also, I think that uh, uh, it's, it, my aunt was, I felt that uh, uh, I, I really felt a very strong presence of the, uh, the Virgin Mary there. Uh, without thinking about it, I, you know, I did not go thinking that that's what would happen. I knew that, uh, you know, this was, the, you know, we refer to the Manatos as the, uh, the Garden of the Seotokos. But uh, always there, I, I felt a very, very strong presence. And I had, you know, as I always do, I had, you know, some things on my mind, uh, more worldly things. And, uh, and I felt like I was being scolded. While there in my in my prayer, I felt like I was being scolded and and um, you know and guided and, and told not that that's not the way you should be thinking. It's not the way and you should not be you know uh, allowing yourself to go that way. Uh, but really, it was not just uh, being directed, but actually being scolded. You know, like a mother would school a child. And, uh, and it, was, it was a very, very moving experience. And I know that, um, that everyone, all of us that went there, um, uh, felt very moved by that experience, uh, by being there and having been there. The first couple of times that we were there for the services, we were there first, so we would sit in the front. And uh, Southeast right over here, magnificent, uh, both sides, just like uh, we do here in Tiffany. And there was one time we got there, and this, uh, other, there were several other groups that were touring, and they happened to uh, get in there early and they all the seats. And a couple of us, Terry was with me and uh, a few of the others, and we went uh, in the back against the wall. And um, the monks saw us back there, and uh, they came and took us. That's what made us come up front with them and stand in the uh, Southeast area where they had seats. They gave us their seats. And this was out of respect for the bishop uh, that they had done this. But at that time, they bent over backwards to, to make sure that uh, everything was just absolutely perfect for us. Uh, I joked about the uh, long service that we, we attended, but I, I am telling you, um, it's, it's uh, you know, like Bob says, that it, you can't explain some of those things. It was not. Difficult. It was seven hours, seven and a half hours. Uh, we, it, it, nobody complained about the service. They had this huge chandelier in the center. It's amazing. What they do when they get to the significant points, like on the liturgy of divine liturgy, when they get to the doxology, you know, how, how you know, we all stand up and we get excited at that point as we start the, the actual divine liturgy. They take that chandelier, which is the size of this whole area here. It's a huge chandelier. They got candles on it, and he starts spinning it. And then they go, but there's one guy, one of his jobs, and each has their own job there. And there's a lot of jobs that they do. One is the guy has to start swinging, he rotates it back and forth, and eventually it just goes you know, like this, and it swings back like this, and just rotates for about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and then uh, they do other interesting things. They have all candle lights, they have electricity there, but in the cathedrals, it's candle lights. They're, they're just like just like in our church, we have candles. They have the candles up there on these candelabras, but they they're up in the, the very elevated. They bring them down with their cords, okay, at, at certain points, extinguish them, and then light them again. Okay, I never could understand. I couldn't figure it out.